may have noticed a phrase in the sutta we chanted just now. The cause of suffering is craving accompanied by passion and delight, which makes it sound like all well, delight is bad. which sounds even further pretty bad. Does the Buddha want us to have a totally equanimous, blank emotional state? And the answer is no. He actually recommends six kinds of delight on the path. And not just for the path. He says these kinds of delight can take you all the way to the ending of the effluence. In the passages where it talks about how the Buddha himself delights in some of these things, even after his awakening. The first is delight in the Dhamma, the fact that we have a Dhamma that teaches the way to true happiness. And it wasn't just thought up by somebody someplace, it was discovered after lots of experimentation on the part of the Buddha. And it's been verified by many, many people over the centuries. Think about the Buddha's position after his awakening. He had found a state that was not conditioned by anything at all. Most of our ideas are conditioned by our perceptions coming in from the past, our past background. But the Buddha was able to find something that was totally independent of his past background. That's why his teachings were true. He came back to the experience of the six senses from a different perspective entirely. He could see clearly what led to the deathless and what did not lead to the deathless. It had nothing to do with his preconceived notions. So we can delight in the fact that there is such a Dhamma, and it explains things very clearly. What's skillful, what's not skillful. When we suffer, what is the suffering? Why are we suffering? How can we put an end to suffering? It explains all these things. So we can delight in the fact that we found this Dharma. Think of all the people who, on listening to a Dharma talk from the Buddha, would say that he had turned right side up, things into an upside down, brought a lamp into the darkness so that people could see. A world without Dharma is a world upside down dark. The world with the Dharma is bright. Everything is turned right side up. So I'm delighted in that fact that you have access to that Dharma. And then you follow through. And you're delighted in the fact that you can follow through. That's the next two objects of delight that the Buddha mentions. One is to delight in developing, i.e. De developing skillful qualities, and the other is to delight in abandoning, abandoning unskillful qualities. These are things you can do. As he said, if people couldn't do this, he wouldn't have bothered to teach. So the fact that he bothered to teach means that you can do it. Some of the qualities that we have to abandon can be pretty hard. There's that passage when the Buddha talks about how you should abandon desire and passion. And he gives an example of a man who's been married to a woman, then they get divorced. And then he sees her laughing and chatting with other men, and he gets upset. And he asks himself, why am I upset? And he said, because I still have desire and passion for her. So why don't I just give up my desire and passion for her? So he does. In the past, this makes it sound like it's something easy. You flip the switch. But you know how difficult that can be. You look at people who've been divorced and how long it takes them to get over the divorce. Well, in many cases, getting over the divorce from your defilements is just as difficult sometimes even more so. So it's not necessarily going to be easy, but it is something that can be done. We've got the example of many people before us 
It's not the case that their defilements were lighter than ours, or they were make-believe defilements. They were real. They were strong. But they could do it. And it's not like they were hu superhuman either. You read of cases in the Terigata, Teragata, of people who were really desperate. They got to the point they were suicidal because their practice would develop for a bit and then fall apart, then develop again, fall apart again. But they were able to, able to pull themselves together and come out of that miserable state of mind and become noble disciples. So even if the practice is difficult, as the Buddha said, even if tears are coming down your face over how difficult it can be, stick with it. Because the rewards are great. You know that analogy he gave. He said if you could make a deal, that you'd be speared by 300 spears a day, 100 in the morning, 100 at noon, 100 in the evening, every day for 100 years. But you'd be guaranteed stream entry at the end of that time. The Buddha said that would be a good deal compared to all the suffering that people go through not having gained the Dharma eye. So it may not be easy, but it is possible to abandon skillful qualities and develop skillful ones. And you should learn how to delight to whatever extent you can. It's the reason for joy when you can say no to a defilement. Even if just for a night, as the Buddha said, just realizing that an unskillful quality should be abandoned. That in itself is skillful. The more often you think that thought, you finally get to the point. You say, might as, well, might, might as well do it. Might as well try. It's something to delight in. So that's three things to delight in. The fourth one is to delight in seclusion. Finding a space for the mind where you can put down your burdens, not have to deal with all the issues of other people, and focus on your own issues. Even if there are a lot of issues in the mind, the fact is that you can focus on them, you don't have to worry about other people's issues. That's something to delight in. It's an opportunity that very few people have. Think of that story of the elephant. He lives with cow elephants, he lives with baby elephants. He goes down to the river while they were gone down to the river ahead of him. They bump into him as they go down, turn the water all muddy. So he goes off, lives alone. When he goes down to the river, the water is clean, nobody bumps into him. When he has an itch here or there, he takes a branch with his trunk and scratches himself here, scratches himself there. And he feels gratified. He's free from all of that disturbance. On well, the same way, you learn how to delight in getting alone. Get the mind to settle down. Get some pleasure out of the breath. Get some pleasure out of the concentration. That way you allay your itch and find a well-being that comes up from it inside. So learn to delight in that. Then finally the Buddha says to delight in two things that are actually nibbana, or, or epithets for nibbana. One is the unafflicted, the other is non-objectification. Unafflicted in the sense that you're not causing any pain to yourself, any pain to anybody else. Totally without disturbance. A happiness that doesn't have anything to eat away inside. As for non-objectification, objectification is the 
type of mind state where you create a sense of who you are. And then based on who you are, you need to feed. And when, because you feed, you have to get into conflict with others. So non objectification is a state of mind where you're not getting into any conflict at all. So you delight in these two things. Not so much to the extent that you have them, but to the extent to which what you are doing is going to lead there. You're on a good path and it goes to a good place. Learn how to delight in that. Because the world would have us delight in all kinds of other things. There are people who delight in the idea that there is no real truth. No objective truth, so you can just make up whatever truth you want. There are even Dharma teachers who claim that. So they would delight in non-Dharma. What kind of world is that where there is no real truth? There are people who delight in developing unskillful qualities and delight in abandoning skillful ones. It's a lot of fun. There are people who delight in company, having lots of entanglements with other people, lots of networks. There are people who delight in causing affliction. I mean, there are actually people who choose war. There are people who delight in conflict, again, choosing war. And a lot of them have power. They're delighting in all the wrong things. That's the way of the world. Here the Buddha is offering a good alternative, a delight that leads to peace, harmlessness, truth, all the good qualities of Nibbana. So delight in the fact that you're on this path. It's a good path to be on, and it's a good path to complete. And we're lucky that we have it. We don't know how much longer it's going to be available. All the teachings of all the past Buddhas have disappeared. Each new Buddha has to discover them all over again. And even within the tradition of our Buddha, there are times when the path has gotten obscured by popular versions of, of, of the teachings. Think of a John Mun having to find the way again, and all the trouble he went to. But now it's available to us. So take advantage of it. Delight in the fact that you have this opportunity. And when the practice gets difficult, delight in the fact that at least you're heading in a good direction. You're not afflicting anybody. That's a cause for joy right there.